southwest England, leading to a fairly grey, damp Thursday for many. But Northern Ireland should brighten up. Wales, southwest England may also cheer up through the course of Thursday. This line of rain likely to stick somewhere across these central areas. Some uncertainty about the exact position and that band of rain lingers, but parts of eastern England staying dry. Quite mild in the south again on Thursday, 10, 11, 12 Celsius. Signs of things turning colder as we go into next week. GB News is the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. To stay up to date on the latest stories, make sure that you subscribe to the GB News channel right here on YouTube. You can watch us live 24-7 across the whole world. You can also check out exclusive content and catch up on previous episodes of your favourite shows. Every day, we ask the questions that you ask. So why not add your voice to the conversation in the comments section? Don't forget to subscribe. We are GB News, Britain's news channel. Every night at 11 on GB News, we bring you the next day's stories the day before. It's basically like time travel. If it's a big story, we'll cover it, guaranteed. But we'll also have some fun along the way. Big opinions, big laughs. Sometimes big hair. This is Headliners, Headliners the paper review show that won't send you to sleep like the others will. 11 p.m., seven nights a week. Join us. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from six to half past nine on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Welcome along. Happy St. David's Day to you and yours if you are of the Welsh persuasion. On tonight's Mark Stein Show, live on your telly and on your wireless, Ukraine now, tonight, and a year or three down the road. Washington bigwigs want regime change in Moscow. That's sure to work out as well as it usually does. And the rocket man, no, not Putin, Elton, Elton's first manager, Ray Williams is here. He also brought us Steeler's Wheel, as in stuck in the middle with Ukraine. Very popular in the Baltics and Poland. Plus, the most important part of the show, your thoughts, live and in real time. Email me, gbviews at gbnews.uk or Twitter me at gbnews. All that coming up after the news with Rhiannon Jones. Thank you. Here are your top stories from the GB newsroom. At least five people have been killed in a Russian attack on a television tower in the Ukrainian capital of Kiev. In Ukraine's second largest city, Kharkiv, at least 10 people have been killed and 35 wounded in rocket strikes by Russian forces today. The Ukrainian president, Volodymyr Zelensky, has told Russia it must stop bombing his country before peace talks can start. In order to sit down for talks, one cannot sit down when planes are flying over and bombardment is going on. To sit behind a table, the sides have different positions, one that wants to put pressure, one that doesn't want to reach an agreement. We are for dialogue, yes, but the least that must happen is the bombardment of people must stop. Foreign Secretary Liz Truss has announced sanctions against Belarusian individuals and organizations for the country's involvement in Russia's invasion. 
Ukraine's defense intelligence claims there are around 300 Belarusian tanks on its border. It says Russia is preparing a deliberate provocation to justify their entry. Speaking at the Tapper military base in Estonia earlier, Boris Johnson said President Putin had made a disastrous miscalculation in invading Ukraine. I want to be crystal clear finally on that point. Uh, we will not fight Russian forces in Ukraine and our reinforcements, like these reinforcements here in Tapa, are firmly within the borders of NATO members and they are profoundly the right thing to do. The United Nations says more than 660,000 refugees have already fled to neighbouring countries. Home Secretary Priti Patel told MPs earlier that more Ukrainians will be eligible to seek refuge in the UK. Via an expansive Ukrainian family scheme, British nationals will be able to bring in adult parents, grandparents, children over 18 and siblings. Those joining family in the UK will be granted leave for an initial period of 12 months. They will be able to work and access public funds. Secondly, we will establish a humanitarian sponsorship pathway which will open up a route to the UK for Ukrainians who may not have family ties with the UK. From today, train ticket prices in England and Wales are 3.8% more expensive, the biggest rise in rail fares in nine years. The Campaign for Better Transport says the hike couldn't come at a worse time for commuters. And Southend has officially become a city today. On behalf of the Queen, Prince Charles presented the letters patent during a ceremony that formally granted its city status. The late Conservative MP for Southend, Sir David Amos, had campaigned for this before he was stabbed to death in October last year. TV online and DAB Plus radio, this is GB News. Now it's back to Mark Stein. We are in a blizzard of lies. Everyone was very exercised by this, quote, Ukrainian journalist, Daria Kaleniuk, who delivered quite a lengthy rebuke to Boris Johnson in Poland today for his failure to close Ukrainian airspace and send the RAF up to shoot down Russian warplanes. Ms. Kaleniuk turns out to be one of the World Economic Forum's global young leaders. That's the youth wing of the Davos jet set, run by Klaus Schwab. Let's have a picture of Klaus Schwab uh, because he deserves to be uh, more famous. Let's, let's see. Oh, yeah, look at it. That's him presiding over the Supreme Intergalactic Council of other shape-shifting lizards from Alpha Centauri. Oh, no, my mistake. He's getting an honorary degree in Lithuania. Uh, anyway, uh, Daria Kaleniuk is one of his chosen global young leaders, just like Justin Trudeau, Jacinda Ardern and Emmanuel Emmanuel Macron were not so long ago. Fascinating as that is, that's not what first struck me about Ms. Kaleniuk. This was. That's, that's her tweet today. No, NATO members will not close the sky over Ukraine. Leaders of NATO member states will come to the western border of Ukraine to do press conferences instead. These will be the children who will face the missiles, not NATO air defense systems. Shame on you, NATO. And underneath, as you can see, are three Ukrainian moppets beseeching Boris to close the skies over Ukraine. Now, hold that thought. Hold that image. You'd have to have a heart of stone not to thrill to plucky little Ukraine taking on the Russian bear. President Zelensky, who has played an unpromising hand brilliantly in recent days, capped it all off with an ovation in the European Parliament earlier today. European Union countries who don't have any weapons of their own are nevertheless buying huge quantities to ship directly to Ukraine. At the same time, they're opening their borders to Ukrainian refugees, two-thirds of a million in the last six days, almost all women and children. I wouldn't be surprised, given Western Europe's recent experience with quote-unquote refugees, if any of those Ukrainians will ever be going back, which is a bit of a shame, as the one thing Ukraine could use is children. 
Ukraine's main problem is not a shortage of weapons, but a shortage of people. In 1990, its population was 51 and a half million. Today, it's officially just over 40 million, although certain bodies place it rather lower. But in essence, the population has shrunk by 20% since the collapse of communism 30 years ago. Large numbers of Ukrainians don't have babies. Hundreds of thousands of its comeliest and most nubile young women are working as prostitutes in the finest escort agencies of London and Paris. And if the EU were to agree to fast-track membership, uh, the exodus from Ukraine would only accelerate. Fifteen years back, I wrote a best-selling book about demography, uh, which is actually very difficult to do. Uh, but I did it because it explains most things going on in the world. China's demographic problems, its disastrous one-child policy, explains why it will move against Taiwan and assert itself elsewhere sooner rather than later. Putin's expansionist fervor is because Russia could use a lot more Russians, which is why he wants to, quote, gather up the large number of Russians in neighboring states. Western Europe also has deathbed demographics. Angela Merkel's millions of strapping young male, quote, Syrian refugees are essentially the children Germans couldn't be bothered having themselves. But no one does deathbed demographics like Eastern Europe, from Bosnia to Moldova, including Ukraine, which, according to the Population Reference Bureau, has the worst fertility rate in the world of any sovereign nation apart from South Korea. Whether or not Ukraine needs more weapons, what a truly independent Ukraine really needs is Ukrainians. And instead, everything that's being proposed, from the UK's open-door refugee policy to instant EU membership, will ensure that Ukraine just continues to empty out until Vladimir Putin will be able to conquer it with his personal security detail. William Fleischmann joins me now from Kiev. Uh, William is an American uh, living in Kiev, and he wrote a very interesting piece on Ukraine's more intractable problems. Before we get to that, William, uh, how are you and your fellow residents of Kiev holding up on this night where hearing reports that uh, the Russians are encircling the city and from the looks of uh, what they did to Kharkiv, uh, they're not being terribly discriminating in where they fire their missiles. How, how are you holding up? Uh, I'm actually not in Kiev anymore. When this all started mm. on Thursday morning, my family and I decided to go out of the city to our village. It's 100 kilometers east, uh, excuse me, west of the city. We can hear the fighting in the distance, though. Uh, we can hear the artillery, the rockets going off, and every so often we can hear a drone or a jet uh, overhead buzzing around. But we're holding up ver uh, uh, very but, well, but I think. Yeah, because at the moment they don't seem to be taking the active part of the wall west of Kiev. Uh, is that how it feels to you in, in your country home? Yes. Okay, let me turn to some of the points you raised in your in your piece, because they, they were fascinating to me. I mean, all developed nations, all Western nations, have terrible demographic uh, problems at the moment, but none, none more so than Ukraine. What do you think is... We're, we're now uh, a third of a century past the fall of the Iron Curtain. What do you think the problem is uh, with a society that declines to reproduce itself, as in Ukraine? I think in Ukraine there's the problem of... Uh, the uncertainty that tomorrow will bring. And when people aren't certain of tomorrow, they don't want to have children. It's very difficult to make money in this country for a lot of people, especially working class people. The, if I remember correctly, the last time I checked, and this was over a year ago, the average salary in Ukraine was around oh, maybe $300 a month. And no one can mm. raise a family on that. And uh, a lot of people make, don't make much more than that. 
Uh, and also, uh, a lot of people, as, as in other Western countries and in Russia, many people spend, uh, spend a very long time in the university system. As you say, they study till the 40th grade, and uh, by the time they mm. graduate, they enter the workforce, and they spend several years building a career, and then they have a child. But by the time they have a child, it's too late to have more than one. And so that's why you have mm. a, a, uh, <clears throat> a birth rate or fertility rate of, uh, of around 1.5 uh, children per woman. And that's not sustainable. If this keeps going, there isn't going to be a Ukraine at the end of the century. There will be no Ukrainians. And for that matter, there won't be any Russians, Belarusians, Moldovans, Germans, British, Irish, Americans. Mm. Uh, something mm. needs to change. This this can't go on. Well, let me uh, let me just keep going. go on, Mr. Stein. Let me let me talk about the uh, because because there, there are problems with the fertility rate in Ukraine's is absolutely in the basement. Uh, the 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 worst on a very bad continent. I mean, the Germans uh, don't have the uh, the diminished economic opportunities that Ukrainians have, but they've given up breeding too. But you, what you also have in Ukraine is a lot of people leaving the country. And what I've found odd in recent days, which I had no real idea of, because the last time I was in Ukraine, they certainly weren't evident. But yet there's, you mentioned these universities that people stay on until they're 30 or 33 or whatever. There's an awful lot of Nigerians, Indians, all kinds of other uh, foreign nationals at, uh, at Ukrainian universities. An Indian uh, got killed in the, in the Russian strikes on uh, Kharkiv uh, earlier today. What's, what's that about? Is that just a source of... Uh, foreign cash for the uh, Ukrainian universities? Why, why are there so many foreign students in, uh, in Ukraine? Uh, I, I don't have much experience with the university system here, but I think mm. that the universities here are very good. I've met a lot of the graduates from these universities, and they seem smarter than the graduates of a lot of American universities. And I've told a lot of young Ukrainians that instead of going abroad to study, they ought to study at KPI, at Thrushevchenko. Every, as I said, every mm. graduate I've met from these universities is, uh, they're real top drawer people. And I think that's why a lot of people from abroad, from places like India and, Af and Africa, want to come to study here. Maybe they know that. Maybe they know what I know. And also, uh, yeah. universities here are cheaper, and the cost of living here is lower than it would be in a place like Germany or any anywhere in the United States. And as you know, the <clears throat> you pay an arm and a leg if you decide to go get a four-year degree in the United States. Here in Ukraine, you don't have to do that. No, it's it's uh, interesting to me though because it's an intelligent population. Ukraine, no one, uh, no one doubts that. Yet it's it's a bit in the same condition that Ireland has been in at various par parts of its history, where it exports people. Um, we all know it's a cliche because it's true. The hundreds of thousands of young uh, Ukrainian women working as prostitutes in Western Europe. But there is a more general uh, export of its best and brightest, too, that's going on in Ukraine, isn't there? A lot of young Ukrainian men go to work abroad in Poland and uh, in factories, warehouses and service industries. Yes. Mm. They do it because they can't make a and would, they can't make a decent living here in Ukraine. And uh, and would that get worse if uh, if if Ukraine were a member of the EU, and so they could be working in Germany, they could be working in France, the Netherlands, Sweden? Would even more Ukrainians leave? I don't know. It's reasonable to believe so. But if Ukraine is able, if Ukraine is able to hold its own against the Russians over the next several days or weeks, maybe, maybe it'll bring more confidence to the people here in themselves. Maybe more people will want to stay and rebuild and make the country into what I 
into a great power. I think that Ukraine has all the ingredients needed to be a great European power. It has a, an industrial base left over from the Soviet Union. It has an intelligent population. It has a large agricultural economy. We just need to use, mm -hmm. uh, excuse me, Ukrainians just need to use the tools in their toolbox to make this a great country. And what's the only thing that's been lacking, I think, is confidence. But as I said, if Ukraine can hold its own against the Russian army, maybe that confidence will come. Are you surprised at how it's going for the Russians? We're getting reports uh, that many uh, Russians are simply running away. Uh, I know there's I know there's a ton of propaganda going on here, but but setting that to one side, there there has been independent corroboration of Russians who've deserted, and uh, Russians who've gone to the trouble of disabling their own vehicles so they can't penetrate any further. Uh, is that what is that what you're hearing on the ground? I've heard the same things, but. I don't know what's true and what's not. I, I remember uh, that scene from the Battle of Britain where that politician asks the RAF general uh, if he can verify Germany's claims about how many RAF fighters they've killed. And the general says, if it's, if it's true, we'll lose. If it isn't, we'll hold out. <laughs> And the, and and uh, you think the uh, e even if these Russian numbers, uh, the I mean again on the Ukrainian version of events, uh, the Ukrainians are killing a thousand Russians a day. Is the general sense among people around you that actually uh, they're they're giving the Russian uh, they're at least giving the Russians a run for their money they're at least teaching the Russians that this isn't going to be easy and if and if yes. and if the war isn't easy uh, the occupation isn't going to go well either yes uh, even if you we are I believe that we are inflicting an, a high amount of casualties on the Russian army and even if the Russians win, mm. even if they take Ukraine and Ukraine capitulates and it becomes a part of the Eurasian Economic Union, which I hope it doesn't, because it comes with its own set mm. of problems, they are going to deal mm. with an insurgency that's going to be many times worse than what they had to deal with it within Afghanistan. It will bleed Russia. That is why I think that Zelensky and Putin need to come to the negotiating ta table and hammer out an agreement that gives both sides more or less what they want. It'll such a well. We'll such see war, whether su uh, such a war will destroy Ukraine physically, but it'll wreck Russia economically. Well, we're going to explore that later in the show. Uh, thank you very much for that, William. Look after yourself. Uh, it, I'm glad to hear you managed to get out of Kiev, which gets more difficult hour by hour. But even in the countryside, uh, take care of yourself. Uh, let me know what thank you, you think. Stein. GB Views at GBNews.UK or you can tweet me at GB News. We'll get your reaction next. And if you're wondering whether things can get any worse, well, there's always nuclear Armageddon. All the fun stuff straight ahead. GB News is the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. To stay up to date on the latest stories, make sure that you subscribe to the GB News channel right here on YouTube. You can watch us live 24-7 across the whole world. You can also check out exclusive content and catch up on previous episodes of your favourite shows. Every day, we ask the questions that you ask. So why not add your voice to the conversation in the comments section? Don't forget to subscribe. We are GB News, Britain's news channel. Every night at 11 on GB News, we bring you the next day's stories the day before. It's basically like time travel. If it's a big story, we'll cover it, guaranteed. But we'll also have some fun along the way. Big opinions, big laughs. Sometimes big hair. This is Headliners, Headliners the paper review show that won't send you to sleep like the others will. 11 p.m., seven nights a week. Join us. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. 
And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from six to half past nine on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Coming up on Dan Wooten tonight, with the Ukraine crisis proving we need strong leaders in the West, is Donald Trump in a better position than ever to reclaim the White House in 2024? Fresh from CPAC, Nigel Farage weighs in. Plus, I break down the day's top talking points with my superstar panel, the Daily Star columnist and former editor Dawn Neeson. Conservative commentator Calvin Robinson and author and journalist Rebecca Reed. That's Dan Wharton tonight, Monday to Thursday from 9 p.m. till 11 p.m. on GB News. Let's get to your thoughts on Ukraine's uh, bid for express check-in to the European Union. Ron says they're fighting for the freedom of their country and then want to give up sovereignty to Brussels. Seems a strange ask to me. Uh, well, that's true, Ron. That's, that's a kind of debater's point. That's the sort of thing you'd make in the pub just before closing hours. When you're actually being bombed and shelled, uh, trying to get into a club that might offer you a measure of protection isn't necessarily a bad idea. Mel says no, not at the moment, unless the European Union wants to drag itself into war with Russia. Well, the thinking is that uh, Putin would think twice if he were to be waging war against a member of the European Union. And David says the EU will do them no good. The EU really doesn't do anybody any good. It's it, it's a terrible problem, as we're seeing in, with all the bloodshed, having a so-called uh, great power, a contemporary form of empire uh, that doesn't actually have the ability to enforce order in its backyard. We saw that. Do you remember Jacques Post, the, uh, the foreign minister of Luxembourg, the Colossus of Luxembourg? He died a couple of days ago. But 30 years ago, uh, when Yugoslavia started to fall apart, he said as he boarded his plane uh, to go and negotiate in Slovenia, the hour of Europe has come. Uh, and he told the Americans to butt out. Well, the hour of Europe came and went, and he was only too grateful 150,000 corpses later to have the Americans butt in again. As I said the other day, there's room for a second rank power, regional power, where the Austro-Hungarian Empire used to be. And uh, if that, if uh, Woodrow Wilson, I hate to bring up all the uh, uh, blame guys uh, decades after they're dead, but Woodrow Wilson, the American president, hated the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and it was a great civilizing influence on that part of the world. And b basically everything that's replaced it in its provinces has uh, been for the worse. So there'd be a lot to be said for having a big regional power there. But don't worry, Joe Biden, breaking news, Joe Biden says there's not going to be a nuclear war. Uh, so you can take that to the Oh, wait a minute. What's that big mushroom cloud where the bank used to be? Anyway, happy the land these days that does not attract the attention of the unipolar hyperpower in the 21st century. Uh, some of the most rotten families in Washington, starting with the Bidens and Clintons, have their fingerprints all over Ukraine. Uh, but beyond the corruption, there's been a more general fecklessness in American policy. Here's John Mearsheimer speaking at the University of Chicago seven years ago. But I actually think that what's going on here is that the West is leading Ukraine down the primrose path. And the end result is that Ukraine is going to get wrecked. 
Ukraine is going to get wrecked. Just to reiterate, Professor Mearsheimer was speaking seven years ago. But if you're a peripheral startup nation on the fringe of the map, it's flattering to be seduced by the hyperpower, isn't it? And of course, the Ukrainians are playing along with this. And the Ukrainians are almost completely unwilling to compromise with the Russians and instead want to pursue a hardline policy. Well, as I said to you before, if they do that, the end result is that their country is going to be wrecked. And what we're doing is, in effect, encouraging that outcome. As I said, he said that seven years ago. Well, there's more wreckage to come. Congressmen are tweeting about those no-fly zones over Ukraine that Boris Johnson ruled out today. Uh, so there's a few powerful Americans who think we can have nuclear powers shooting each other out of the sky. Washington think tankers, senior fellow at the Brookings Institute, the president of the Council on Foreign Relations, are demanding regime change in Russia. Because if there's one thing America does really well, it's regime change. Look at Libya, where regime change delivered all those Mediterranean ports into the hands of ISIS, who then used them for an unending migrant tide across to Italy and eventually to Folkestone and Dover. Or look at Afghanistan, where the Pentagon took 20 years to change the Taliban regime uh, to a brand new Taliban regime, and then handed them more land than they'd ever controlled before. Mary Dejewski joins me now. You can read her in The Independent and The Spectator and various other places, and you should. Uh, Mary, the view seems to be taking hold that Putin is in trouble and his reign is endangered. Uh, that's the talk in America. It's a lot of the talk uh, here in Britain. Uh, is that how you see it? I tend to see that um, this is probably the biggest danger that he's faced in the whole of his time as president, um, because even if he gains his objectives in Ukraine, and those are said to be demilitarization primarily, not occupation, but if things start to go wrong, and if he gets less than he, his stated objectives, then I think he's in real trouble at home. And he may actually already be in trouble at home, because it's not at all clear to me that there is huge popular support for this war or any war in Russia. And the, 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 there, there is a very interesting section of the population, um, the new elite, the next generation, the, 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 the adult children of people who are currently in power and in very influential positions. Some of them have gone public saying that they, they do not approve of invading Ukraine. And if you're losing that particular stratum of the population, then that's not a good sign for Putin. So uh, we've heard stuff about the oligarchs having to move their super yachts to the Maldives because you can't keep them in the south of France anymore. And we've, we've heard things like that. But you're saying, in fact, it's the, it's the oligarchs, uh, up and coming kids who are the ones who are most unhappy about this. Well, it's partly them, but it's actually more interesting than that because it, it, it's, the, mm. it's the next generation of the people who are actually in the power apparatus, the people who work with Putin, oh. the, the, the ministers in his administration, um, apparently the ex-wife and the daughter of his official spokesman, um, put um, disapproval of the war into their, it, it, on their Instagram account, um, only to erase it later. Um, but it seems mm. to me that it's inside Russia that, 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 that the problems are, not with the, not the, with the oligarchs from outside. Uh, so, so we're now seeing a, a, a situation where if you're inside Russia, as you put it, you're basically stuck there. You can't maneuver around the world as you used to before these sanctions uh, came into place. So that's one demographic that's against him. If these figures are correct, that the uh, Ukrainians are killing a thousand Russian soldiers a day just in this first week of the war. So, you know, tonight 
where there's already 7,000 7, coffins that should be going back to Russia. And right. instead, apparently, they're being in a, incinerated. They've got incineration machines right. that they brought with them. So they're, they're not uh, actually flying them back to, uh, to Russia. So there's going to be a problem with ju just with the rank and file there, with, with people who aren't powerful and aren't wealthy, but who just don't want 1,000 dead Russians every day. Well, exactly. I mean, I have a degree of scepticism about the actual figures that are being presented. I think there may be an element of mm. uh, either wishful thinking or black propaganda there. But it doesn't actually matter yeah. because even if there are only a few dozen coffins going back to Russia, even if there are only a few families who are bereaved, the word gets out. And this is a huge liability for, 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 for Putin and for any leader in Russia. You know, we, we saw the effect of way back when, where, when, the, um, where, when the Soviets were in Afghanistan. That was a war that helped collapse the Soviet Union. That was it was the it was mm. the returning coffins. It was the the disgrace of the war. It was the humiliation of the retreat, and. Any returning coffins, any um, clandestine burials, any attempt to keep casualties secret, that's going to be a big, big problem for Vladimir Putin. Well, let me ask you the big question then. If Putin is uh, not doing well abroad uh, and he's getting sanctioned uh, by uh, Europe and the United States and everybody, uh, and he's unpopular at home, uh, both among people connected to the elite and among the rank and file. Uh, does it, does, isn't that likely to make him more uh, violent, more unpredictable, more unstable, uh, and despite Joe Biden's assurance, uh, risk this whole thing going nuclear in some way? Well, I'm not sure about that because I think he's probably quite um, quite concerned about his own survival as well. So I doubt that. What, what, what I'm particularly concerned about at the moment is that because of all the measures that are being taken against Russia, Russia is going to be so isolated and the, the punishments, as it were, for invading Ukraine um, can't really get much worse so that there's no incentive whatever for Putin to, to really to start serious talks or to make any concessions. Um, that's my big concern at the moment. Yeah. But, but if, if he did think, you know, they're, they're about to topple him, they're maybe about to... He said to watch, for example, the death of Colonel Gaddafi, uh, which was a very brutal end. He said to watch that on video regularly. Uh, if he feels he's getting to the Gaddafi situation, you're not concerned that he might think, ah, oh, to hell with it uh, and, uh, and decide to loose the apocalypse? Well, I mean, you know, you can be wrong, wrong about a lot of things, and I was wrong about whether whether Russia would invade at all. So I can be wrong about that too, but mm. I would very much doubt it. Okay, uh, I'm more reassured by you than by uh, by Joe Biden, Mary. So I I thank you. I sleep easier. Nothing Joe Biden says makes me sleep easier. But uh, Mary, uh, I will get my uh, my full uh, full uh, night's sleep over. I think let's uh, let's get the view on the ground in Ukraine. Sergei Panushchuk is in the town where one branch of my family used to live many years ago, Odessa on the Black Sea, a prime target of the Russians. How are things tonight uh, in Odessa, Sergei? Uh, well, actually, it's pretty calm tonight on the street, but it's not that calm inside mm. our heads because uh, the war has uh, a huge impact on us. Actually, yeah. Mm. Not a, and, it's uh, not something new. Yeah, carry on. Mm. Uh, what well, I there, wanted there's to say is talk. that... Uh, sorry? No, no, carry sorry. on, what carry I, on. Okay, so what I wanted to say is uh, the reason why this war uh, actually happened is because West doesn't know shit about Ukraine and Russia. Why the war in Afghanistan mm. begin? Because 
West did not know shit about Afghanistan because West is arrogant. Okay, and okay, we're we're live. We're live, Sergey. We're live on television, and so you can't use the S word uh, oh, that you've used sorry, a couple I of times now. And I know. know that, yeah. No, I no. So it. don't uh, just. Uh, just keep it within the realm of uh, because we're before the watershed, as they say in the UK. So we'll get taken off the air if you keep using words uh, like that. So don't don't okay. say those I, words. I but carry you, on. I will. I will not be using it. Hmm. So uh, no. the problem is that um, uh, these spies that were in Ukraine, they um, gave uh, Putin wrong information. So they, they they told him that everybody would welcome. Russian soldiers here. They told him that people want to be liberated. Why they? Why the? Uh, why they did this? Uh, it's because they were paid actually great of, uh, amount of money to um, to please him because it's uh, you know it's an old Soviet tradition to please your leader. Why Chernobyl mm. uh, had mm. blown up because there was a certain mm problems in the technical constructure but they should have uh, built it till certain time and they just they just decided we wouldn't tell them because we want to please our leaders that's why this war right. has happened putin believed there will be a blitzkrieg that he will take care for 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 a few hours or a few days this didn't happen why because he was misinformed he was disinformed by his agents uh, in 2014, he was also disinformated. He wanted to um, um, he wanted to add Odessa as well to to Russia and other right. regions of Ukraine, but people actually didn't want that. The same hap the same happens now. I am a Russian speaking um, citizen. I also speak Ukraine. I also speak English. That doesn't make me Englishman. Mm. I'm a person, first of all, mm. and I don't want to be mm. liberated with with uh, when my home is bombed. I don't want to be liberated from my life this way. And nobody mm. nobody asks people what they want. Nobody asks people of Russia what they really want. Nobody asks people of Ukraine do they want this war. And the war. War, war well, is atrocity. Let me atrocity. let me just let me just ask you let me just ask you about that because that's a very interesting point. You say you're a Russian speaker, but that doesn't mean you want to be living under a Russian regime. Do you think in the in the Donbass, where we're told that uh, Putin is incredibly popular and where he has these two breakaway republics? Do you think a lot of people in uh, a lot of uh, Russophones, Russian speakers in the Donbass feel the same way and they don't want to live under Vladimir Putin either? I have no idea what what these people think because I I wasn't in, at uh, Donetsk or at Lugansk. I don't know what these people mm. think. I can't talk. Uh, I can't put words in their mouth. But what I what I really know that uh, bombs do not make you love you. It's impossible to be loved mm. if you bomb cities, if you kill children, if you mm. just destroying the city, if you're destroying someone someone life. It's impossible to be loved. It's it's not the way. It's, yeah. it's not the right way. No, that's a very good point. And it looks as if this very night, uh, not in Odessa, but in other Ukrainian cities, as if Putin has abandoned the idea of getting you guys to love him and is just going for straightforward bombing of apartment houses and other residential areas. Stay safe, Sergei. Godspeed. Uh, as I said, Odessa is a town that looms large in my family and uh, we shall pay particular attention to it. Uh, some of the signs coming up, you can ask me anything, gbviews at gbnews.uk, you can Twitter me at gbnews. And if you're Putined out, as Sergey seemed to be, my next guest will provide a welcome respite. Don't touch that dial.
GB News is the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. To stay up to date on the latest stories, make sure that you subscribe to the GB News channel right here on YouTube. You can watch us live 24-7 across the whole world. You can also check out exclusive content and catch up on previous episodes of your favourite shows. Every day, we ask the questions that you dare. So why not add your voice to the conversation in the comments section? Don't forget to subscribe. We are GB News, Britain's news channel. Every night at 11 on GB News, we bring you the next day's stories the day before. It's basically like time travel. If it's a big story, we'll cover it, guaranteed. But we'll also have some fun along the way. Big opinions, big laughs. Sometimes big hair. This is Headliners, Headliners the paper review show that won't send you to sleep like the others will. 11 p.m., seven nights a week. Join us. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from six to half past nine on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Man cannot live on global conflagration alone. So I thought in the closing moments of the show, we'd take a break from the woes of the world. Oh, well, we don't have that, apparently. That was uh, going to be a song called Scarecrow. And it's the very first song that Elton John and Bernie Taupin wrote together, even though they didn't write it together at all. Instead, a man called Ray Williams handed a sheaf of lyrics to a chubby pianist called Reg Dwight and suggested he try setting a couple of them to music. Since then, Ray Williams has had a half century of thrills in the music and movie business, and we're delighted to have him with us. It's, uh, it's great to, to see you, Ray. It's actually true that, isn't it? That, uh, that Elton, or Reg as he was then, came in to see you and he played, he, he played the piano and you thought, yeah, he's a pretty good pianist, but he just has no idea of lyrics at all. Well, actually, um, not, thank you for having me on, by the way. Thank you. Um, one of the yeah. uh, things I did, I was head of A&R for Liberty Record. Can you hear me okay? I guess you can. And, yes, uh, I can, certainly. He'd answered an ad. He'd answered an ad. And uh, I managed to... Uh, Get about three, four thousand letters from this ad, and uh, he came in to see me, and uh, we sat there, and I, he was there. He is wonderful. Um, mm. <laughs> that's great. Um, can you? I, I'm just worried <laughs> you can't hear. But anyway, uh, no, I can hear very in, well. The audio is great. I sat, oh, good. Thanks a lot. Uh, I sat there and started talking to him, and uh, he told me he was very frustrated about uh, not able to sing more songs with Long John Baldry and his band Bluesology, and he wanted to make some mm. records on his own. So, in short, um, he'd come for this audition. So I asked him to sit down at this piano in my office and uh, <laughs> play a few songs. And he sat down, and of course, he was a brilliant piano player. And he was just, he had a marvelous mm. voice, but he really didn't look like a pop star in those days. And of course, he admitted to me that he couldn't write any lyrics whilst he might be able to write some music. Long story short, I took him to uh, Denmark Street, um, to a recording studio called Regent Sound. And uh, we made some demos. And my record company, Liberty Records, didn't like him. 
So I said, well, I like you. I'm going to try and help you a little further. So I sent him to a couple of friends of mine that I was also helping. And I suddenly got a letter in from this chap called Bernie Torpin. And Bernie had written to me and said that he essentially a poet and maybe he, his lyrics could be set to music. And so a little bell went off in my head. I read these lyrics. I mean, they were out there and uh, they were really good. And uh, I actually sent them to Reg or Elton, as he, uh, uh, he was almost known then. And uh, they started to write together. And uh, Bernie, uh, I invited him down to come down to London um, if he was down in London. And uh, that was the start of it, really. And then he came down and I introduced him to Elton. And we went on from there. Yeah, Hello. it's very strange, actually, because if, because if it if it weren't for you, Ray, uh, there weren't people. Bernie Taupin has been a full time lyricist now uh, for half a century, and it's actually kind of very hard to be a, a lyric writer now. It's not like Rogers and Hammerstein uh, or George and Ira Gershwin anymore. But it's thanks to you, you found a guy who who was basically a poet. And you put him together with a, a piano player who just hadn't any feel for words. And you came up with uh, one of the last great songwriting teams. Yeah, I mean, I have to pinch myself sometimes, but they really were great together. They developed over a couple of years. And uh, then Elton asked me to be his personal manager. And I became his personal manager <laughs> with, uh, and then had to do it with Dick James. And uh, hmm. we started promoting his music, and uh, we did very well in Europe. And uh, then we had to go to America, and unfortunately, we didn't have any money really to go to America. And Dick came up with the money and managed to get a gig called The Troubadour. And uh, he got there, and everything kicked off from there. There's a lot more to it. Yeah, he changed. He ch yeah, no, no, but that, that you're hitting the high spots there because uh, Elton John put the piano back in rock and roll in many ways. All these guitar-driven acts uh, suddenly found yeah. that with Elton doing all this stuff with piano, they had to start putting pianos in, uh, in their... I'd like to ask you about the opposite kind of story in a way. Uh, who's, that's also one of yours. Steeler's Wheel, stuck in the middle with you, Jerry Rafferty, Baker Street, one of the great pop records, that fantastic opening saxophone. And yet Jerry Rafferty had an absolutely terrible end to his life. He, they, they would announce that he was living in Tuscany or Ireland or England. And it turned out he was just going from one hotel to another until they kicked him out for one kind of various uh, bad form of behavior. And he just basically spiraled downwards and died. Um, what's the difference as you, as a manager, from your point of view, in guys who can handle pop celebrity and others, it just destroys them? I always remember Jerry, Jerry had a great fear of performing. He didn't like performing really. And uh, I always remember when we were recording um, the Steelers Will album was stuck in the middle on it at the Apple Studios in Savile Row. And we had Lieber mm. and Stoller, legendary uh, oh, writers yeah. themselves, produce the album. Mm. And I always remember hearing Stuck in the Middle. I remember turning around to Jerry uh, Lieber. And I said, this is a hit. This is, there's no lyrics on it yet. It's a hit. Mm. And he said, yeah. Mm. He said, I wouldn't worry about it because it'll either be a hit or not. You know, it's wasted energy to think about it. But he, he went on to say, uh -huh. that, he said, I think Jerry, though, is a gifted amateur. And by that, what he meant was Jerry was a great writer, great at recording, but couldn't give himself completely to the business he was in. Elton was all in with the ability to go and perform. And he put the energy into it, mm. whereas Jerry didn't put the energy into it. I think any young artist today has got to be fully committed 
it's not just singing a song or it's not just yeah. uh, recording something. You've got to be in it to perform, um, to work hard, and there's no easy way to get out there, particularly these days. So hard work, never give no, up, I, I... are very important. Yeah, it's also, there's a psychological thing. Lieber and Stoller, since you mentioned them, um, I think understood that because they knew the difference between being the guy who wrote that. I used to see them from time to time, and they, if they did their little act, they used to do I'm a Woman, the hit they wrote for Peggy Lee. And they, they I can't remember whether it was Lieber or Stoller now, used to do all the Peggy Lee moves and actually uh, for the for the duration, because they knew that was, you, they wanted a performance of the song. They didn't want some guy sitting yeah. at the piano doing an And Then I Wrote Evening. And I, I Lieber and Stoller doing Peggy Lee was was worth the price of admission. You, you have to, it, sometimes even if you have hits like Jerry Rafferty, it seems to like eat away at your soul if you're, if you're not fully committed to it. I think a lot of the questions in Jerry's head was why? Why this? Why that? You know, there was not enough positive energy. And uh, mm. Yeah, mm. there's a lot. I find it very sad with Jerry because I think he was enormously talented. Um, and I, yeah, I, you know, of some of the artists I've been involved with, I find him very sad and the sad end. And it's a shame, really. But there's, you know, there's a lot of tragedy. Now, in you were the music 20. Industry. You were 20 Sorry? when you took that ad. You, you were 20 years old when you put that ad in the paper and Elton and Reg Dwight and Mike Batt and all kinds of other people answered it. Do you think to 20-year-olds these days that uh, pop music has as much purchase on them or are they more into computers and Instagram and whatever and, 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 and the music business doesn't have the same hold? Whoa. Well, first of all, I was 19. I lied about my age. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, but there's one thing that is pretty constant all the way through huh. is that you still need great material. You still need great voices. And even today, you know, the, the thing I find here in North Carolina is going out and finding new talent, even here, you know, that's young, huh. you know? Yeah. and needs a bit of yeah. a hand. Yeah. And uh, there's a few of us yeah. here trying to help young talent. I mean, it's always there. I think the transition of the industry, well, you, you, um, yeah, I'm trying to write a book at the moment. I need your help. But um, it, it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's a, it, it has changed so much. But the one thing common yeah. all the way through, there is still great talent, even though maybe it it's, uh, now has to work in a lot of other media areas, whether it be uh, games or, you know, other, other media, TikTok or whatever. Yeah. And I find, but it's still yeah, common, it's, you need the talent, you know. And yeah. Jeff Lynne, of course, yeah, you're right. somebody else that is one yeah, of my favorite you're, you're, talents. You're right about you're right about that. And it's still out there. You just have to make sure you uh, direct it in the right place. Thank you very much, Ray. Uh, great to Thank be you. stuck in the middle with you, even if uh, just for a few minutes. Oh, we can do one question, I think, from Jamie, uh, who says, which previous prime minister do you wish could come back and run the country today? Oh, no question about it. It's got to be the Marquis of Salisbury, just for the beard. Uh, that'll do it. Never fear. Dan Wooden's going to titillate your Tuesday for two swinging groovy hours. Stay safe, stay free. Hello again. After a sunny day today across the north, it's going to be a rather grey day for most places tomorrow. But it will still be sunny across the northwest of Scotland, where this area of high pressure will hold on. But further south, low pressure is moving in. These weather fronts bringing a pretty wet evening across southwest England. But that rain on this weather front is continuing to track northwards, so spreading into parts of South Wales and across the Midlands also, and eventually into North Wales and northwest England too. But much of northern England, northern Ireland, Scotland having a dry night with the clear skies persisting across Scotland, turning cold out there by dawn. We will see a fairly widespread frost, but further south, look at that seven in Cardiff and Southampton to 
start Wednesday, but it will start pretty dull and pretty damp here. Further outbreaks of uh, rain trickling northward. So a very different day over northern England, north Wales, and the rain will spread into northern Ireland as well. So gone will be today's sunny skies. We will hold on to them across northern Scotland, but we will see cloud and eventually even some rain trickling into central and southern Scotland too. Not much rain across eastern England. So much of the day will be dry here. Quite mild in the south, we could get to 12, maybe 13 in the southwest, but not feeling all that mild. Generally, 9 or 10 will be a top temperature. Through the course of uh, tomorrow evening, that rain will continue to spread northwards into parts of Scotland. So we'll see a bit more over northeast England, easing off for a time elsewhere before another line of rain then works its way from Northern Ireland into Wales and southwest England, leading to a fairly grey, damp Thursday for many. But Northern Ireland should brighten up. Wales, southwest England may also cheer up through the course of Thursday. This line of rain likely to stick somewhere across these central areas. Some uncertainty about the exact position where that band of rain lingers, but parts of eastern England staying dry. Quite mild in the south again on Thursday, 10, 11, 12 Celsius. Signs of things turning colder as we go into next week. GB News.